Hello everyone and welcome to another twin test. Today I have a pair of gorgeous Porsche 911s. To my right in the grey corner you have my recently acquired 996.2 Carrera 4S. And to my left, brought here by Stephen from the channel 118GT, you have his Basalt Black 997.2 C2. So we're going to find out two things today. If you're looking to buy your first 911, which one should you go for? And if you perhaps already own a 996, is the 997.2 worth upgrading to? So let's stop talking and let's start driving. So we're starting in my 996 C4S. Now a quick little recap for those of you that are fairly new to the brand, what exactly does that mean? 996 is this generation of 911, introduced in the very late 90s and running to about 2004, 2005. The 996, it's fair to say, is one of the most hated of 911 generations, but I actually really quite love it. Now one real reason to love it is because a lot of people don't, you get a hell of a lot of car for the money. And whilst prices on 996s have seen some appreciation in the last few years, it's nowhere near the rise that a lot of the other models have seen. So you can still pick up a decent working 996 for mid-teens in the UK. Now this being the C4S means that it's the four-wheel drive version of the car in the wider turbo body shell. The engine is a 3.6 litre flat six producing around 320 horsepower. It delivers its power in a very interesting way because unlike a lot of other naturally aspirated sports car engines, this one really is at its best in the mid-range. From about four to 5,000 RPM, this car pulls really, really hard. Now, if you prefer your engines a little bit revier, the best thing to do is to fit a full induction kit to one of these. You will lose that mid-range punch, but you'll gain a lot more fizz in the last few thousand RPM. But for me, as I'm using this car as a daily and an almost strictly road car, the way it drives now is just fine. Now this car I would say is worth in the low 20s. Very, very good examples with very low miles can fetch up to about 30,000 pounds. This is the most desirable of the 996 models if you exclude turbo and GT cars. This is the second generation of 996, which means that it ditched the much hated fried egg looking headlights. It still wasn't quite the classic 911 rounded look, but it was much improved. The 996 C4S can be easily identified by the big red reflector at the back of the car, which is very similar to the one that was used on the 993. And it's one reason that I think this car does look quite sexy. It's something that I originally didn't like when I started getting into 911s a few years ago, but now actually I do really quite like it. This car has an aero kit, which is that wing on the back, and it's also got a turbo style splitter at the front. Those are add-ons. Those are factory options, or certainly the aero kit is anyway. That's not a standard thing. So if you prefer your 911s to be a little bit more discreet and a little bit less boy racer, that's easily changed anyway. Now on the interior front, I would say that the 996 is definitely feeling its age. You have kind of cheap plastics and not a lot of leather and 996 interiors overall haven't aged brilliantly. This car's also had an awful amount spent on it recently, trying to make it very good, but a couple of things still need to be done. There is a little bit of bubbling on the arches, which I hope to sort, and the suspension is a little bit creaky and squeaky. Now, of course, your official Porsche dealer will tell you that the sky is falling and that you need to replace half the car to sort those squeaks and rattles, but most times it turns out to be a bushing, which can just be helped along with a little bit of grease. Porsche will not want to sell you individual bushings, they'll want to sell you entire arms for the suspension. 
people like Powerflex, of course, will happily help you out and save you an awful lot of money and improve your car's handling if that's the route that you would like to go. For me though, the real reason that you would buy one of these cars is not for the way that it looks, but for the way that it goes and the way that it handles. The 996 to me is the last of the real pure 911s. You know, the interiors, eh. Nobody really buys one of these cars to impress people. Yes, a large part of the car is shared with the Boxster which is not a particularly cool association. But if you've driven a Boxster, you'll know that they are brilliant handling cars. And the 911, of course, is the better car. Porsche would not allow it to be otherwise. This thing is absolutely superb. And these slightly older cars do go down a B road very, very well. Let's see how it does, shall we? The exhaust on this car I thought was standard, but it actually isn't. It's been modified internally so that it sounds just a little bit better than stock, but it's not a sports system or anything like that. So this is a relatively authentic exhaust tone. The car turns beautifully and there's a real difference in handling depending on whether you've got a full or an empty fuel tank. The front end bobs and weaves in a really classic 911 fashion. It's an absolute delight. There's loads and loads of feedback, both through the wheel and through these sports seats. Again, another thing I didn't realize, but these are sports seats. They're not the standard items. They're not anywhere near as sporty as the modern cars. But in many ways, if you're looking at something that's going to be a daily driver and the price these are at, you probably are thinking of something as a daily driver. That's only really a good thing. Now, because I'm a tart, I am probably going to be changing the exhaust on this car, and I have many, many different options. I'm probably going to go down the custom route, and I have a guy that I know and trust to do my exhaust work, and when that's done, I'm gonna, of course, do a video on it. For now, this thing, that sounds all right. Other ways you can improve the noise on these are by fitting air filters, but I warn people, do not fit a very fruity exhaust and an air filter. I drove a 996, which was so equipped once, and when you hit about 4,000 RPM, the entire car shook. The noise was that loud. Uh, just not cool. There are, of course, quite a few quirks. Reading the speedo is unnecessarily difficult because Porsche decided that you wanted a gauge which only reads in 25 mile an hour increments and a really tiny digital display. So that's not particularly helpful, but yeah, there you go. Otherwise, this is a nice enough thing to be in. People will moan about the interior for being old, but the truth of the matter is, it is old. It's over 20 years old, so it's just fine. Get in a 20-year-old Vauxhall. It's a lot worse. For now though, people can't really make up their mind as to whether the C4S is overpriced or destined to be a future classic. A lot of them have been beaten up and not serviced properly and not looked after. This one has an incredible history file. I have nearly all of the service invoices for the car going back 107,000 miles and that's really quite impressive. Yeah, there's squeaks and rattles and things I want to sort and the odd little bit of rust, but if I'm being honest, overall, the car has held up very well. Sat-nav, of course, is showing its age. That was a very expensive option. The Bose sound system isn't really that good, and that's sort of typical Bose, really. But you don't buy these cars for that sort of thing. So before we hop into the 997, I'm going to switch seats with Stephen and get his opinion on my older car. 
So this is my second time having a go at a 996 C4S. It's very, very similar to how it drives my uh, my 997.2, really. And having having known what I know about this car now, I don't think I would have spent the extra money to get the 997.2 because driving-wise, it really it gives me the same sort of experience. I mean, I'm not like uh, regretting that I bought a 997.2 anyway I'm really happy about the car I still am um, but I just think I would have chose slightly differently knowing what I know now like the, the IM, IMS and the RMS issues which I studied a lot about on the internet uh, really kind of a shot you know scared me away from this car so that you know that engine could blow up at any time and and it will be you know catastrophic so it's something I, I've read a bit too much into, I think, because there's a lot of places which, which could sort that out very, very easily. You could get IMS bearing upgrade, or you just get it changed out when, um, when you change your clutch. So what else I can say uh, compared to my 997.2? Obviously the interior uh, in the 997.2, it feels very modern. The whole car feels fresh. Um, it's still very up-to-date. Um, it doesn't look dated compared to a 991 at all, really, um, in terms of styling cues. What are the cars? Um, I considered a R35 uh, GTR, and I also considered the... I also looked at the Evora and also the Jaguar... Uh, SK, SKR, is it? And I, I guess uh, I never really looked at German stuff. So uh, my, my other half actually encouraged me to look at Porsche. And after driving quite a few, uh, I, I drove a, C, a C2S. Um, Realised I didn't need a power of a C2S. So I think the C2S, the Dot 2, has 385 brake horsepower. And, you know, unless you are a very, very competent driver on the track, you won't be able to make a, make a lot of use of that extra power. And, um, yeah, and I just went for, I went for the dot two instead of dot one. So we're now out in Stephen's car. Stephen's car is a 2009 997.2 Carrera 2. Again, for those of you not familiar, let me break that down. This is the next generation of 911, and it's the facelift of that generation, that being the dot two bit. Now that's very, very important because one of the things that people are scared about with 996s, as Stephen spoke about, is these engine issues. And that plagued all of the 996s, bar the GT and Turbo, all of the Boxsters and all of the Caymans for quite a long time. However, with the introduction of the second generation 997, Porsche brought in a completely new engine known as the DFI because it had direct fuel injection. There were a lot of other upgrades and things as well, but that was the biggie. Now, this car, like mine, is a little bit too quiet for my liking. I've heard 991.1 911s, which is the generation after, but still has the same engine, and the sports exhaust they did on those sounds absolutely glorious. So I know that with a little bit of help in the acoustics department, this car can sound amazing. That being said, you can hear it from inside. It is, of course, pure mechanical noise. There's nothing helping the engine or the exhaust noise get into the cabin. It's all done for real. This cabin is a massive step up in quality compared with my 996. Just everything about it feels an awful lot nicer. 
That being said, everything is still in very much the same place. Under the skin, the 996 and 997 are very, very close relatives, and that's very obvious when you're seated in one. I'm really, really not fond of the style of this steering wheel. I don't know why, but the design of it just bugs the hell out of me. For some reason, it feels like it's a cheapo wheel. I feel like there should be buttons here to do something. It just feels like it's a basic wheel. I mean, it's it, it's the same wheel they used in a lot of the 997 range. I don't know why it bothers me so much, but it does. What doesn't bother me at all, though, is the quality of the gear shift. I haven't driven a manual 997 until now. The only one I've driven was PDK equipped. And truth be told, the first generation of PDK isn't perfect. It's certainly not the gearbox that Porsche have evolved it into now. This manual, though, is probably as good as they got. It's absolutely delightful. The clutch pedal is easy to operate and very easy to modulate. And this car has only got 32,000 miles on the clock, but it feels like a new car. What also helps this car, if you're thinking of something as a daily driver, is the fact that it has PASM. That's Porsche Active Suspension Management. It's Porsches go at adaptive dampers, and that means that you have both comfort and sport settings for the chassis. I'm currently in the normal slash comfort setting, and it definitely rides better than my C4S, which is quite impressive when you consider the fact that the C4S is on 18-inch wheels, and this is on 19s. When Stephen first showed me a picture of his car, I wasn't really in love with the design of these wheels, but having now seen them in the flesh for a little bit, I really, really do quite like them. Now, in the 996 generation, the C4S didn't actually have any more power than the later C4. There wasn't a 996 C2S. That was introduced in the 997, and for the first time in a long time of Porsche history, the 911 was offered with different engine sizes. This is something that they'd done in the 60s and 70s, and it then sort of stopped in the 80s, and they reintroduced it with this generation. So the entry-level cars got a 3.6-litre flat six, and the S got a 3.8. Now in this car, you have 345 horsepower, which is only 10 less than the previous generation 997.1 Carrera S. Torque is up a little bit on my car, not really anything to write home about. This is lighter than my car by about 35 to 40 kilos. That turbo body shell and all-wheel drive gubbins in the C4S really does bog it down. It tips the scales at over 1,500 kilos. If you want a really lightweight car and a really pure driving experience though, what you should seek out is a first generation 996. Those are really light with the Carrera 2 being under 1,400 kilos but they don't have such luxuries as a glove box and all sorts of other stuff. They were very basic cars. This one, by contrast, is much more luxurious and really does feel quite different.
Now what this car really likes to do, which mine isn't so keen on, is rev. It pulls harder from about 4,000 RPM and then it keeps pulling right to the red line. As a sports car, this is a much, much better engine. That front end still does the classic 911 thing. And of course, farm traffic is always predictable when it comes to ruining your fun. Joy of joys. What a sensible, sensible place to park a massive lorry. The steering though is just missing a little something. I can still feel quite a bit coming through, but it just isn't waiting up in the corners like I would like it to. The steering in my C4S is definitely heavier and a touch more feelsome, and that's not just because mine is the all-wheel drive model, which I know a lot of people will blame it on. The 996 generally had quite a bit meatier steering. That's one of the things that makes it, to me, feel more like the old air-cooled cars, the 993 in particular, which had very heavy steering. This is certainly talking to you, but it's just, just that, that little, little disconnect. Overall though, as a car, this is a much, much better thing than the 996. The last time I reviewed a 997, I wasn't really all that taken with it. And ironically, I had actually been driving around in a 996 C4S the week that I drove the last 997. That car was a C2S equipped with PDK. This is a C2 equipped with a manual. And perhaps that's why this is a real back to basics 911 made in possibly the last era when the regular car was perhaps the best one to get. Any real bad thing is that because the DFI engines are very much sought after and the 997 is seen to be very much a last of line item, you will of course pay a real premium to have one. Prices for these, if you find a very leggy example, are going to start in the low 30s. Do not confuse them with first generation 997s, which actually in some ways are cheaper now than a very nice 996 and you'll pay anywhere up to £50,000 for a regular C2 or C2S of these, and even more for a GTS, the GTS being the last model, which was a special car that gave you power kit, gave you all sorts of goodies and things included in the price. And that's why people love those. So, conclusion time. Which one should you buy? If you're looking at a car that's a daily driver, I would have this every time. If you want something that's more of an occasions car, I would get the 996 C4S. If I was made to pick a car out of the two, I genuinely am not sure which one I'd have. I think I would probably echo Stephen's comment that it's somewhat difficult to justify the extra price premium that these carry. The good news is that if you do buy one, it's probably going to hold its money fairly well. That being said though, 996s have basically hit rock bottom and then started coming back up already, so I wouldn't worry too much about the price of one of those. So. There you go, two fantastic cars, and if you're going to get your first Porsche, I think you could do a hell of a lot worse than one of these. They're available in a wide range of colors, specifications, and budgets, so thank you guys for watching. Thanks to Stephen for bringing his car down, and we will see you guys all for the next one. Bye-bye.